Welcome to Science Minds. I am very, very pleased to be joined by Linda Feichner. Thank you so much for coming and chatting with me today. It's a pleasure to be here. Excellent. What I'd really like to do first is just go back a little bit in time and hear just kind of your background. What um, your educational background, what brought you to the field kind of generally, and just get a sense of where you come from. Sure. Well, I've always been interested in psychology from the get-go. Um, I never seriously considered other pathways. Uh, I know some people do other things and I would say from the get-go I was pretty interested in psychology and um, as an undergraduate elected that as my major from the start. What I didn't know was sort of which pathway to go in that pretty large field. And so I actually ended up at three universities in three years. My third university was UCLA, which I intentionally chose um, because by then I had figured out I really wanted to go into clinical psychology. And UCLA had just an abundance of opportunities uh, where I became involved in the autism project, really enjoyed behavior therapy experiences, became involved in research and um, and there and there I, I came into finishing up undergraduate and moving on directly into a graduate program. Mm -hmm. And can you talk maybe a little bit about the shift from undergrad to graduate right, school? Right, sure. So um, I decided to apply to clinical psychology programs all around the country and chose SUNY at Stony Brook because it was a combination of being a top tier behavioral uh, school um, where I could learn um, behavioral intervention approaches and also do research. So have this kind of combination of, um, of training in both worlds. Those were my two favorite worlds, research and clinical work. Right. And so that really sort of has translated into your career in terms of intervention work and right. merging the two. Can you talk a little bit about um, how you see sort of the clinical piece informing research and research informing clinical? Yes. So I had a wonderful opportunity at Stony Brook working with Dr. Susan O'Leary, who was my mentor, and she had a little one-room schoolhouse on campus at Stony Brook, uh, and it was housed about eight kids with hyperactivity. Um, I don't know that the label of ADHD had come to fruition yet. Um, but there they were, and um, our research focused on classroom management strategies. And we worked with the teacher and um, would guide him through different approaches to try. And as researchers, we sat behind one-way mirrors and observed the effects on the students. And it was before you needed any kind of magical statistical modeling or anything complicated. You could see the effects right there. These were single subject designs. We saw wonderful graphs of outcomes that were direct, re, directly related to the um, strategies that the teacher was using. So I kind of fell in love with that kind of research, yeah. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. And what, what specifically about sort of ADHD? Where was the, the draw there? Um, in terms of, I think it's been a very interesting population to work with. I mean, part of the draw is that it's such a common condition uh, and it affects so many different people. Uh, and I find the kids very vibrant and positive. Yeah. Uh, even though they have many challenges, um, I was drawn to work with that group and their families from, from pretty much the get-go. Uh, and it felt like there were things we could do to improve their lives and so it was kind of in a sense somewhat manageable in that way. Yeah. Thinking about um, sort of how as clinicians and researchers we've thought about and approached ADHD over the years, mm -hmm. how have you sort of seen sh changes and shifts especially like thinking about like kind of the ADHD um, epidemic and like a over diagnosis in the, like in the 90s and the early 2000s and how would you say sort of those trajectories have impacted or informed your work? 
and um, I'm just interested in kind of in, in that interplay, especially over time. The interplay between just between like how maybe in way, ways that you sort of see our our understanding or conception of ADHD changing and shifting oh, over right. time. Oh right, which it has done um, over the years uh, with new editions of the DSM. We have new characterizations and as we learn more about the disorder um, then that informs uh, our diagnostic process also uh, and so I think that it's shifted to, to a better understanding of how attention issues are really a critical role of the disorder itself and not, it wasn't just sort of a hyperactivity problem and it wasn't just something that was for kids so uh, it was broader than that. Attention was a, a, a key variable. Um, but we also understand that it's a heterogeneous group of kids who come not just with ADHD, but often with a host of other challenges. And so it becomes treating not just ADHD, but the other aspects to their mm -hmm. um, situation as well. For sure. Um, I've noticed in some of your work recently, you're doing like work in Mexico mm -hmm. and kind of expanding out. How have you seen some, maybe some of the challenges or differences thinking about, um, you know, your intervention work and ADHD like cross-culturally? How is, yeah. how is that going? It's a very <laughs> interesting question. I mean, I think some of this is the beauty of behavioral interventions. I've approached this from somewhat of a non sort of diagnostic lens. We're looking for patterns of behavior that correspond with ADHD, but we're not requiring cases in, for example, our study to meet full criteria for ADHD. So, um, so we're looking at that. And, uh, and there are cultural aspects to this because we know there's, even in the US, differences in the rates at which people are diagnosed. Um, and that's probably true across a lot of conditions. And in Mexico in particular, the um, environment down there was um, less um, aware of uh, sort of diagnostic um, sort of issues around ADHD. Uh, and so that, but that allows for the use of our behavioral approaches in a way that's more welcoming. Mm -hmm. um, sure. Which might be true here too, uh, that families and teachers and um, and folks are are more likely to gravitate towards interventions that maybe don't require labeling for a to mm -hmm. take part in these in these studies. For sure. Well, and that's I think a really strong benefit of single case design mm -hmm. that allows it doesn't necessitate you know these very strict labels right. or you know characterizing the group. You can describe the individual at on a, like a behavioral level. Yeah. To your question about the cultural aspects in, um, in terms of our intervention in particular, it was my uh, postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Lauren Hack, who's taken the lead mm -hmm. on adapting our intervention program for Mexico, for Spanish-speaking families in Mexico. Uh, and so she did a very, you know, sort of careful look, a stakeholder-informed look at um, what adaptations might be needed in that context. Um, so there were some adaptations that, that she made to better align the program with the culture in this sort of school day down there, which maybe doesn't include homework as regularly, might be different hours, et cetera. Um, but on the whole, the strategies themselves were effective in the same way they were here. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the same positive outcomes across cultures. So that was really exciting. That is awesome. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. What are some of the other aspects of um, the work that you're doing or the work kind of more broadly in the field that is exciting to you right now? Well, it, my work has taken me into the schools, as you know. Um, and what it excites me about that is bringing what we know are evidence-based approaches, mostly developed in a university research setting, which is where most of our evidence-based approaches are developed, and it's bringing them to authentic environments where people live and work, basically. Um, so rather than requiring families go to a clinic to get services, we're offering them in um, contexts where the, the kids will be. And we know that's where kids get most of their mental health services. But the services that they'd been getting were really 
not um, supported by the empirical data that we have. Mm -hmm. So being able to offer these services train in that environment by training the school clinicians to implement the services right there is very exciting. I actually still get thrilled watching. We, we now, we train our folks virtually. We've moved to a virtual uh, format. Uh, and um, watching the, our school clinicians gain the skills and be able to then impart them to the families and the students and see change is really exciting. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. One, um, as a former teacher, uh, I was a special ed teacher for 10 years. But um, one of the things that I'm sort of interested in and interested in your perspective on is like scalability. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like there's probably a sweet spot of training you know, educators and clinicians in schools uh, with fidelity, but, but also like doing it in a way that is like cost effective and efficient. But I think there's probably a balance between those two things. And I'm wondering what your perspective is on how to hit that balance the right way where, where like educators and clinicians still feel like empowered and successful in their ability to utilize that training while not, not getting like burnt out or feeling like it's just another, you know, web-based training tool. Yes. Yes. What is your experience with that? Or yes. Thoughts okay. About that? So there's lots of pieces to what you said. Yes, um, and and one affects the other. So the training that our school clinicians um, that we provide our school clinicians is very intensive, more than that they've really ever received, and they very much appreciate it. Um, uh, we not only provide workshops and describing the strategies and how to use them, but we observe every one of their sessions and we coach them along the way and we provide immediate feedback about how they're doing or suggestions about things that they might want to change in order to match fidelity requirements. Make sure that the important key content is being covered. Um, so we do that and also we do uh, our uh, weekly just kind of supervision with them. So there, that's an intensive process. So then that backs, and, and they appreciate that. They love that. Um, our content is also fairly scripted. It makes it easier. They don't have to go home and, and learn. We, learn a lot of things outside of the hours of the supervision because we know that they're limited in their time. But even so, that the scalability is related to how, how can we train a larger workforce to do this. Uh, and so, so that's where we moved into the, the remote training, yeah. right? So that became much more doable than driving around San Francisco, which is what we did. Drive around each of the schools, do it on site. Well, we knew we were never going to leave San Francisco if, you know, that was it. So, um, so we're doing this, you know, the virtual training, which is going well and starting to work with a different district, another district, and plan to try to move out to additional districts, too. Um, so, so there's still there's still a labor part of it. There's still time and effort required. There's still a need for school mental health. Yeah. So in some ways, the scalability is related to what our society is having to say about what's the value of school mental health. What are our public dollars going to go toward? Yeah. Where, where do you feel like you know, the, the important gaps are to be thinking out five or 10 years? Like where do you, where do you feel like the, the, the spaces to make up and to really continue to move forward are. Right, so the gap I think is, is one, the workforce, having a workforce in place at school sites that can take on some of the challenges around providing mental health services at schools and there's quite a bit of variability there across districts. Um, so there's gaps in terms of our workforce and then in terms of the training. So most of the training that the um, the school staff are getting are sort of more like one day professional development or two day if you're lucky and then that's it. Nobody follows up, nobody checks fidelity, are you doing what we just spent, you know, two days, solid two days covering, nobody checks on it. And, 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 and so it's hard to really learn, it's hard to sustain uh, an intervention in that, in that kind of a context. Right. What would you say, like thinking forward? Um, you know, looking to out again like five or ten years, are you excited about or eager to see sort of the, the movement um, 
in the field? Like, where do you where do you sort of see the direction of things heading that you, that you that you feel really positive about? Right. Well, things I would I mean I would love to see evidence based strategies like these more widely available to more families, more students. Um, if that can happen in the next five to ten years, I mean. Uh, uh, that would be that would be wonderful, um, uh, but you know, any movement in that direction, I think people are trying to develop um, more and more feasible approaches that can sort of high impact, lower effort approaches, uh, and evaluating those kinds of things, uh, and that would be ideal um, if we can do that. Uh, but I don't think what we want to do is sacrifice our, the effects of our known treatments um, because of a need to keep our resources curtailed. What advice would you give to educators who are really, um, who are really eager and passionate about the mental, you know, improving mental health, behavioral um, aspects of their students, but run up against these like sort of embedded bureau bureaucratic issues, funding issues. Um, we know like the speed the speed of change in education right, is right, right. so slow. But I'm just wondering like what do you sort of what do you say to to educators who are like young, passionate, but are butting up against some of these like more structural difficulties? Right. Yeah. There's, there's a lot you can do in the context of your own classroom, if you're a classroom teacher or even if you're a clinician in the schools, um, in terms of managing your interactions with students who sometimes even bring more challenges than they might have in the past. Um, so there's a lot you can do one-to-one. -one. In terms of working with the uh, outside the classroom, maybe what you're bringing up are the greater challenges with administration and, um, and sort of uh, what flexibility there might be to in incorporate other models in your work with these students. Um, and I think the more that um, educators can bring in the science on this, the better, because the science is pretty clear about what is helpful mm -hmm. um, for these students and families and, um, and what can make a difference. Uh, so I think that that, that can be helpful. and. Um, networking with other, even networking with other districts that might have different practices in place. Because we see lots of variability across districts. Yeah. Um, and, and so knowing, and, and often districts talk to one another and if they see somebody else doing a, a program, they might be more likely to sign on to that <laughs> right. program. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, for sure. So, so there might be a little bit of that that can be helpful too. Yeah. Well, it's absolutely lovely to chat with you. Thank you so much for taking some time to talk about the work that you're doing. It's really inspiring and important work. So thank you so much. Thank you. The UC Davis Mind Institute was founded in 1998 with the promise to reduce and prevent the disabilities that can be associated with autism and other neurodevelopmental conditions. Every day, our clinicians and researchers make progress on that promise. Our groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other conditions associated with disability are helping affected individuals achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website or our social media platforms to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.